around my story. I am addicted to food. I suffer a lot. I need help. I've tried to give up, but I fail every time. Hamburgers. Who can give up eating hamburgers, especially with barbecue sauce? I didn't mind this kind of addiction, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me begin by introducing myself. I am Patricia, 15 years old, living with my parents and my brother. I lead a quiet life, no interests, no hobbies, except for eating, that is. Food is my faithful friend. It never leaves me. It is my partner, my soulmate. But having food as your soulmate has insidious side effects. A dark side, if you will. It denies me a healthy life, robs me of the energy to play, and causes me to sleep excessively. I would much rather stay at home with a bag of potato chips than go out and exercise. My soulmate ultimately betrayed me, though, last Thanksgiving at my granny's home. She lives in a state nearby. Granny was a clever doctor and an excellent cook at that. She could conjure up something really delicious. On that day, she had prepared barbecue turkey with nuts and other secret recipe ingredients. The taste was so great, as if it had descended from heaven itself. I felt like I was fighting a food war, and I had to win at all costs. I ate and ate and ate. I don't know why, but I just couldn't control myself. I attacked that turkey like it was the last on the planet. But every culinary war with a worthy adversary, such as the barbecued turkey, has its own unique type of casualties. Suddenly, I found myself unable to breathe. I fell to my knees and passed out. The turkey had won. I woke up later in the hospital, though, still clinging to an unfinished turkey leg. The doctor told me that I was gaining way too much weight. He said that I should be put on a diet. Diet? Man, how I hated that word. It hung over my head like the Sword of Democles. It meant depriving me of my passion, my reason for living. I considered eating vegetables in small amounts to be the worst form of cruel and unusual punishment. The worst form of torture imaginable. Imagine thinking of a wonderful, greasy, cheese-laden pizza with all the toppings and then suddenly opening your eyes to find a healthy green salad bowl. But I had reached a turning point in life. One day, my brother was playing on the street. While I was sitting at home, gazing longingly at a tempting piece of cheesecake, just sitting there, taunting, daring me to eat it. I struggled mightily to resist the urge, but in the end I succumbed and wolfed it down like a starving animal. Shortly afterwards, I began feeling dizzy, but I was unable to call for help this time, and then I passed out again. I was taken to the hospital while lying in the hospital bed, half conscious. I overheard the doctor say to someone, she needs to stop eating or it will be the death of her. I thought to myself, whoa, death? So I made up my mind right then, right there. I resolved to fight a new war, a war against my appetite. On our way back home, I told my father that I wanted to see a nutritionist. He was delighted to hear that. Later, at the clinic, the doctor welcomed us in. She told me how to overcome my eating fetish. She gave me a strict diet regimen, with a schedule full of healthy meals. I kept telling myself that winning this war was possible. I simply had to be patient and persevere. I stuck to the strict diet and did some physical workouts. My parents supported me wholeheartedly. I was enthusiastic. I can totally do this. A week passed quickly, and I eagerly visited the doctor to receive some good news. When the doctor weighed me and told me that my weight hadn't changed at all, I was crestfallen. She looked at me and asked me, how was this possible? I told her I didn't know, because I was following her diet thoroughly, though it did require a tremendous effort on my part. Another week passed, and again I went to the doctor. The results were the same. She said to me, Patricia, are you sure you're following the diet I prescribed for you? I said yes. She sat there wondering. Then she told me with a puzzled look on her face, it's odd, but your weight is increasing, not decreasing. This unexpected piece of news mystified me. Another week passed. No change. The doctor was nonplussed. I returned home with a dejected look on my face. My father asked me what was wrong. And when I told him, he laughed. Do you believe that? My father actually laughed at my predicament. I was furious. He gestured an apology with his hand and then told me that it was my own fault. I was puzzled. What are you talking about? He told me that I had been sleepwalking to the refrigerator every night 
and eating everything in sight. I was taken aback. I couldn't believe it. Stop acting like he didn't know it, he said. You must have been awake. I replied, no father, I'm not acting. I was truly unaware that I've been sleepwalking and eating in my sleep. But now that we've finally solved the mystery of the increasing weight, we returned to the doctor with this new information and told her the situation. She laughed and told me that my discipline had denied my body the food it craved, but my brain had refused to cooperate and had overridden my will by urging me to eat in a subconscious state. She told me not to worry though, that she could treat that. Armed with this knowledge and her support, and the support of my family, I felt that I could finally win this war. I am Brenda's child, or at least I was, because my grandmother had died and my mother at some point in her life felt that drugs would be beneficial to her. I was put into foster care at the age of two and adopted at the age of seven. I have no real memory of Brenda, just her name and the last time I saw her. I was seven and I had gone to a foster care agency for a visit. She brought me some strawberry candy. I remember my adoptive mother telling me to say thank you, and I did. Then Brenda got up and told me she would see me again. I went back to the agency a month later for a visit, and she never showed up. My mother was gone, and I was no longer her child. I was fully aware of being adopted because my adoptive parents, who I've lived with for the past four years, asked me how I would feel being their child, and I said I had no problem with it. So they adopted me and my biological sister at the same time. I can remember that when I got adopted, I was happy, but at the same time sad. I was happy because I had a family, a nice warm bed to sleep in every night, plenty of food to eat, and a place to run around. I was sad because I never got to say goodbye to Brenda. And the last time I saw her, I didn't take in what she looked like. I was sad because she never showed up to me again. She had lied when she said that she would. I'm not sure why I never saw Brenda again, but for years, I looked at myself as an intrusion. I figured she didn't want to see me anymore because I needed things and that would get in the way of her buying her drugs. When I went to sleep, I'd have dreams that Brenda had been looking for me and found me. I'd have dreams that she would recognize me and come up to me and say, it's me, your mother. But I never talked about these things. I guess I just didn't see the point. It wouldn't have changed the feeling of loneliness that she had left behind. My adoptive parents didn't make it that easy for me to talk either. It wasn't that they weren't good to me. They took me on road trips, they took me to, and great adventures, and they got my hair done every two weeks. They gave me a stable home, something I probably would have never had if I had been in foster care or still lived with Brenda. But my adoptive mother jumped to conclusions when I would try to tell her little things about boys or school or anything that happened in my life. She always assumed I was getting in some kind of trouble. So there wasn't any way I would have told her about my most painful private thoughts, even if I had thought of telling her. Instead, I just tried to be a nice kid who always seemed happy. I would smile, laugh, and joke. I'd come home and talk about everybody under the sun and how they were doing, except myself. I didn't want my adoptive parents to feel as if I wasn't appreciative or that I didn't love them. So I tried to act as if everything was good. When you're adopted, you feel like your adoptive parents at one point or another are going to expect you to be grateful. You imagine they're thinking, we could have left you in foster care. A and I was grateful, but there was still a part of me that was angry at having to be grateful for just being their child. There was a part of me that didn't trust their love. A part that said, what makes you love me when my real mother didn't love me? What's so real about your love? When I was angry, I expressed my pain by either writing or acting out, or sometimes both. At school, I had a quick temper. I got into physical fights and cursed people out. I ran away from home a lot, more times than I can count. My family couldn't understand why I acted the way I did, and neither could I. I just knew that I felt bad. If I was out in the street and the thought of her would enter my mind, I would turn my head and find something to distract me. If I was at home, I would get up and grab a book or watch television. But even while I blocked her out, the hurt continued. 
and my behavior got worse and worse. I spoke whatever was on my mind and cared very little about how people were feeling. My most common response to anything anybody said to me was whatever. I was rude, rebellious, and the smallest things ticked me off. I had a non-caring attitude, and the worse I got, the more frustrated and angry my parents got. By the time I was 12 or 13, my mother and I weren't really getting along. She often beat me, and a couple of times she could have seriously hurt me. Whenever I got on my mother's nerves, she would tell me, I don't care who you go and tell that I punished you. If they want you, they could have you because I am tired of you. Or she'd say, I never had this problem with my sons. Why couldn't you be like them? I felt like my mother didn't want me, even though she had adopted me. I felt that she wanted a replica of her children, who didn't act out so much and didn't get in trouble in school standards I could never live up to. It didn't help that much that my extended family never really accepted me. Every Christmas, they acted funny towards me. I found out later that some of them never wanted my adoptive parents to adopt me in the first place. When things got really bad with my mom, I went to one of my aunts for help and she threatened to call the police on me for running away. She didn't like me and the truth is, she didn't like my mom either. And she just didn't want to be involved. I ran away for the last time when I was 14. Even though my mother wanted me back, I felt she had put me through too much to return. I rejected the only family I had had for the last 10 years. A family I had come to feel didn't want me, but just put up with me. Even though my mother wanted me back, I felt she had put me through too much to return. I'm 19 now, and I've been on my own for the last five years. I've lived with a friend, I've lived on the streets, and I've lived in a foster care home. I've grown a lot, but I haven't really come to terms with my feelings about being given up or about being adopted. I have friends and other people who support me now, so to a large extent the feelings of loneliness have disappeared, but my anger has not. Instead of blocking it out, I talked to my boyfriend about it and tried to make sense of it all. Maybe one day I will forgive and forget, but right now I feel like the only true family I will ever have is the one that I will one day start. I do have some contact with my adoptive mother. Sometimes I talk to her when I call my sister, who still lives with them. My mother wrote me a letter apologizing for the past, and she has even asked if she could come to my college graduation. I'm thinking about it, but I'm not sure I can forgive her yet for all the things she said and did to me that really hurt. I don't think I will ever forgive my extended adoptive family. They weren't there for me and my mother when we were having troubles. They didn't stick by me. They made me feel like they never wanted me. To this day, I carry around with me this feeling of not belonging and this feeling of wanting to belong. When I was younger, I was able to block the memory of Brenda out of my mind, but now it's not so easy. I look into the mirror and I want to know who I look like. If the children I intend to have one day ask, mommy, what was she like, your real mother? I want to be able to answer that, or I'd like my kids to be able to ask her for themselves. It seems like the chance of finding her are as slim as the skin peeled off an apple, so I gave up on that. I realize I may never find her. I'll have to accept that. Still, I want to find her, and the thought of her comes into my mind often. I am angry at her. I am angry because she lied to me, and I am angry because she left me. But I still believe that even if I found out that Brenda was not alive or even in jail, it would bring a sense of closure. It would fill up that empty space in my heart. Do you guys think I should keep looking for her? Or is it too late? My name is Keanu and I'm 13 years old. I am a psychopath. I freely admit it in front of all of you. I attribute my sickness solely to my father because any story about a cruel father pales in comparison to my father. He would abuse me physically, mentally, verbally, and emotionally in every given moment. He left no stone unturned in this regard. He would beat me into unconsciousness. He accused me of being the cause of my mother's death, who died during my childbirth. Whenever dad had any problem at home, 
he would accuse me of being the cause of it. <laughs> One time he even beat me at school when my teacher called him to school because I had beat up my classmate who had beaten me up first. I tried to explain to him, but he wouldn't listen and he just beat me even more. One day, it was fun day at school and everyone was supposed to invite their parents to visit the school for party and introduction activities. I chose not to invite my dad, so I was alone at the festivities. I felt envious of all my classmates for having loving parents to have fun with. My teacher noticed me alone, came over and offered to be my parent for the day. I was so happy. We had great fun together. Miss Linda had lost both her husband and her son in a plane crash. Only, she had survived. After fun day had passed, Miss Linda showed more interest in me. She would bring me sandwiches and spend time with me during breaks. I thought of her as my mom. When I succeeded in my final exams, she hugged me with tears of joy. I unconsciously said, thanks mom. I went home happy that day, but had to face my dad again. He asked me why I was late coming home, and I told him about having to pass my final exams. He didn't believe me though, and asked me to show him proof. Unfortunately, I had none, so he began kicking and punching me. There was a knock on the door. He tried to block me from opening the door, but I managed to open it. Miss Linda was standing there. She glanced at my bruises and bloody face and moved between me and my dad to protect me from further abuse. Dad snarled and threatened her with a beating if she didn't leave immediately. But she hit him in the eyes with a blast of mace or pepper spray, and he went down to the floor in extreme discomfort, grabbing at his eyes. Miss Linda called the police, told them about Dad's child abusive nature, and had him arrested. Now I live with Miss Linda as my new mom. Dad is in prison, where I hope he stays till he dies or rots. <laughs> Either outcome is okay with me. This time, you get to know the truth about the haunted piano. I left. I went to work. Then I came home and went to bed. Everything was back to normal just as I told myself it was. Music started playing again. That's when it hit me. This was not paranormal. It couldn't be. It was a cheap trick. Margaret must have programmed the piano to play itself. It was just a prank. A laugh at my expense. That's why the damn thing was free. I ran downstairs to solve the mystery once and for all. Like clockwork, as soon as my foot touched the bottom step, the piano stopped playing. I walked over to it, confident in my new theory. Upon opening it up and exploring all of it, I was surprised by what I saw. It was just a normal piano. Nothing extra was added in its creation to make it play on its own. My calmness was not calm anymore. I stared at the red wood and ivory keys before me and almost felt compelled to ask, what are you? Instead, I remained silent. This silence, however, was quickly interrupted by the sound of music as the piano began playing itself once again. I wanted to run, but fear kept me still. I watched the horror unfold. The keys were being pressed down hard, controlled by an unseen force. A hunting piece filled the room as pictures fell from the walls. The house began to shake around me. My eyes darted back and forth in fear. But then I noticed something outside. Standing at my window was a shadowy figure. I ran outside to escape the madness. All the while the song went on. The house continued to shake behind me. The dark figure was nowhere to be seen. Margaret has not rigged the piano to play on its own. But I was not losing my marbles either. This was something entirely different, something out of this world. All at once, the music stopped playing and the world around me with it. No wind, no cars, no animals, and no people. Nothing. It was the middle of the night at this point. But where were the crickets, the frogs, or even the trees? Where was life outside my home? A little exploration revealed that I was truly by myself. 
every living creature in the world had disappeared. What the hell was going on? Why was this happening? I returned home, hoping for answers, but instead, I saw an unsettling sight. It was so dark, I almost didn't see it. Standing completely still next to the piano was the same silhouette from my window. My body was shaking with fear, but the figure did not react. It was frozen like the rest of the world. The shadow was wearing a dark cloak, one that covered its entire body. At its face was nothing but pure darkness. I studied the figure for a few more moments before a familiar sound filled the room. The piano song played, and in an instant, the world returned to life. I fell to the ground, but managed to escape, crawling out the front door and rushing over to my car. I got in and took off with no specific location in mind, happy to be anywhere that was not my own home. I started weighing my options. Destroying the piano came to mind, but the risk outweighed the reward. It could just as easily backfire, angering whatever spirit was haunting its keys. Seeking help wasn't really an option either. The only person who might believe me was Margaret. That was it. Margaret. Maybe she would know what to do. It was late, but I didn't care. I drove over to her place. The dark figure was there, standing at her door. Before I could turn in the opposite direction, it grabbed me by the arm with its bony fingers. Its strength kept me anchored in place, and then it disappeared. I had no choice but to return home. I hesitantly stepped past the piano and walked up to my bedroom, where I locked the door and fell into bed, mentally exhausted. I would not have even a moment of peace. As the song started up again, the second my head hit the pillow. But I remained still, sick of the repetition. The banging on my bedroom door that followed, however, succeeded in freaking me out. I jumped out of bed and pushed my dresser to the door, and I hid under my sheet. The banging persisted, but I chose to instead focus on the song allowing myself to properly listen to it for the first time. Surprisingly enough, it was beautiful. Dark, but beautiful. Its melody soothed me, relaxing me to the point that my eyes grew tired. I fell asleep and I had a dream. The dream world I found myself in was different. It was overwhelmingly vivid and real. Words like surreal, and otherworldly, just don't cut it. The awareness I had is also difficult to explain. I was completely aware of my surroundings in the sense that I could feel everything about them. I know that doesn't make much sense, but it's the only description I have to offer. The dream was in a forest. It was large, and at the center, a large red tree stood tall. Every fiber of my being knew where I was. This was the blood tree, the precursor to my piano. As I admired the beauty of the blood tree, a person stepped out from behind. He did not speak. He simply pointed at the tree. This is when the piano leaked into my dream. The song played as glowing lines ran up and down the tree's bark. The man put his hand to the wood, motioning for me to do the same, and I did. It was an incredible sensation. My eyes were filled with visions, a glimpse into the blood tree's past. Its bark wasn't always red. Native habitats came up to the tree every year. They would slice their hands open and place them on the tree's trunk. Their blood then dripped to its base representing the lifelines of their people. It also signified becoming one with nature, feeding the tree life from within. It was the anchor that kept their community together. This is where they gathered and enjoyed life. A place free from worry, a safe place, 
This was also where the natives buried their dead. After that, one of the elders would play a song. The same song my piano played every night. It was their song of death. When it was all over, a final offering of blood was taken from the fallen and painted on the blood tree, granting their spirit safe passage to the afterlife. When the vision stopped, my new friend released his hand from the bark and pulled out an unusual instrument. He began playing the song of death, but then stopped. 